that you guys are here for him. So, yeah. So, thank you guys. Uh, we've been to events with Vision UCT, we've been to Stellenbosch. Um, we still have a few more jobs to go in terms of the universities that we're going to go to, but the electricity here has been so amazing, and I'm sure. <laughs> So what's next, as she you know, rightfully said, what's next is you. You are the, you know, students are what's next, people are what's next, citizen activism is what's next. We are not subjects, but we are citizens. You know, we're not moved over, we need to be led. We need leaders that inspire us, not intimidate us. So um, before I hand it to Cassie, I mean, I, I don't need to introduce him, you guys really know who it is, with all the videos that he's made. But I just want to say a warm thank you to you guys for um, giving us the opportunity to come and speak today. Well, uh, first and foremost, I have to just thank you so much for taking a chunk out of your valuable time to set this up so that we can have a moment together to just encourage and just to maybe share ideas on what it is that we can do at this very special time and very special moment in our nation. I think one of the statements that I've loved now over the last couple of weeks is the statement that simply says, what a time to be Zimbabwean. What a time indeed to be Zimbabwean. And so my fellow citizens of the Republic of Zimbabwe, citizens of the Republic of South Africa, and the citizens of the many beautiful nations here represented, a good evening to you. A good evening also to Dr. Mavizela, who I'm told is here, the Vice Chancellor. Thank you so much for allowing me to come onto your campus this evening, sir. I understand that you may well be accused of having allowed a modern day dissident to speak on the campus <laughs> of this wonderful institution. But thank you. I do know that we also have many respected men and women that serve within this institution, and many that have served even before as well. Of particular mention, of course, to my good friend Ellis DA is the former Dean of Students, Dr. Vivian de Klerk. I'm told that you are well loved and well respected within this institution. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Ivan Mawaride. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a pastor. I'm a friend. And indeed, I'm one of the many souls famished by a life devoid of the opportunity to contribute towards building the future I want for my children. It's a future that not only that I want, but a future that my countrymen also want. I am by no means the most qualified person to represent the desire, desires and cries of Zimbabweans who for many years have carried in them a hope that seems with each passing year to be more of a mirage than a possible reality. The real story of deferred hope can be better told by the pensioner who cannot access their measly $40 per month 
which when they compare with the years of struggle for our liberation, or the 40 relatives and friends whom they lost as they fought against oppression, it pales as fitting reward or a story that they can proudly tell to their children. It's an oppression that has robbed generations of the ability to dream. It is one that has robbed generations of the ability to create inheritances that can be passed on. Our parents have nothing, not because they did not work hard, not because they did not invest or plan ahead. They have nothing because someone was evil enough to take everything that they have worked for and then intimidate them to never asking or demanding explanations as to why the land of milk and honey has become a cold cave of physical discomfort and nightmares. But today we stand. We stand against disgraceful corruption, that shameful, merciless beast that has been reared in the pens of our senior government officials. Over the years, that beast has devoured our chance to build world-class hospitals that anyone would be proud to walk into. Our brilliant minds that our schools have created have become economic slaves of other nations, while Zimbabwe slowly loses hope that they will ever come home to her. But today we stand. We stand out to tame this madness that our generation cannot afford to allow to carry on anymore. Today we stand up against injustice. The injustice against an abandoned people who are only trying to make life work again. When our government demonstrated that they did not care for us, we created our own jobs. We started our own businesses without their help, and yet they heavily taxed us. They ban our ideas, and they scare our investors just because we refuse to give them a slice of our sweat. But now we stand up. We stand up not just as one person, but as millions of Zimbabweans who desperately want to see our nation to reclaim her honorable place amongst the nations of the world. We stand up as many movements that are representing not just issues, but people. But people and their future. People with ideas. People with strategies and people with a compelling vision of a nation that they want. Do you hear the sound of a missing son? Do you hear the disappeared daughters of our nation? So many of our fellow citizens have disappeared, not to be heard of from again, because they dared to raise their voice to oppose our government. Questioning the government or claiming our rights can sometimes cost you your life and cost you your friends and relatives as loved ones. And at this point, I must pay homage, just like the speaker spoke earlier on, that there are men and women who have paid a heavier price than I have in saying the things that I have said. In times of matter, we don't know where he is. We don't know whether he is alive. So one of the reasons he disappeared is that you and I allowed him to stand alone. But today we stand up to say not anymore shall a citizen speak the truth and be mishandled and be subjected to abuse and injustice whilst we look. We stand together and we say not anymore. Do you hear the voice of the businesswoman trying not only to feed herself and her family, but also create jobs for her community? But exorbitant taxes, flawed fiscal policies, chronic cash shortages, and corruption have guaranteed her failure even before she begins. Do you hear the voices of a thousands or thousands of university graduates who cannot get a job in their country? The voices of teachers, doctors, civil servants who probably won't be paid on time again this month, if at all. Do you hear the sound of the young girl who needs assurance that her dreams are just as valid in our nation as her brothers are? As 
a pastor, I'm reminded of the story of a young man called David. David decided that not another day would go by without his voice registering on the timeline of history for his nation. He arrived at the battlefront and heard somebody say something against his future that made him uncomfortable. He stood up and he asked the question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dares defy the armies of the living God? Today, my generation stands up to ask the same question. Which government is this? that dares to, def to devour the future that I am trying to build for myself and the future of my children. Today we stand up for this. <laughs> Honorable ministers of our government, how do you go to bed at night knowing that there is no water at a major referral hospital, yet your swimming pool glistens with water that you knowing that there is no water at a major referral hospital, yet your swimming pool that your many homes glisten with water that you have never jumped in. In fact, why do you have a <laughs> when we all know that none of you can actually see. But Mr. President, Mr. President, do you realize that one trip to Singapore can fund the building of a clinic and stock it with medication for months on end. Do you realize, sir, that it is ridiculous to arrest and threaten citizens and tell them never to return home simply because they have challenged you and suggested a better way of doing things? How is it, sir, that we can identify and arrest people who want to build their nation and accuse them of violence and treason, and yet we cannot account or at least arrest just one person for a missing $15 billion? this to citizens of other nations what happened to that money without saying it was you. <laughs> Let me explain to you fellow citizens how this government has treated us with a little story. A young man got married and after he got married his wife banned him from taking any more alcohol. And she said to him, I would that if you will stay with me, you don't drink anymore. The young man agreed and said, yes, baby, I will stop. <laughs> As expected, the guy's night came along. And off they went. He resisted for all of about five minutes. <laughs> and decided that he would have only one. One became two, two became three, three became four, and four became five. <laughs> what his wife had asked of him. And they said to him, listen, we remember that your wife asked you not to drink anymore. We shall therefore not permit you to have any more. He looked at his friends and tried his best to convince them that he could at least take one more with him home. And so he said to them, no, I will not drink another Let me just put this in my bed pocket. 
I must, I find it important at this point to reaffirm that I am a genuine bastard. <laughs> so on his way home, this young man, drunk as he was with this bottle of booze in his back pocket, slipped and fell as he got to his home and fell on his back. The bottle broke and his cuts is high importance. <laughs> At this point, he realized that his wife would find out and that their marriage would be in trouble. And so he devised the plan that he would sneak into the house unnoticed. He would make as little noise as possible. And he would make his way to the bathroom where he would clean himself up. So he did that. Into the bathroom, he arrived and found a full-length mirror. And so he took ointment and he took plasters and he began to attend to himself until he was convinced that he had covered it all up. He went into bed and was soon asleep. Early in the morning his wife woke up and she went into the bathroom. No sooner as she got in that she walked out and ran back into the bedroom screaming, I told you not to drink but you disobeyed me, you lied to me and you did it. He was shocked, how did she find out? And she said to him, you come with me if you think I'm lying. And they went back together into the bathroom. And right there on the full length mirror was all the ointment and all the... <laughs> because, he was, because he was so drunk, he didn't realize that the wounds he was dressing is not the one on his dress. <laughs> but why do I tell this story? I tell this story because it feels like you and I as citizens of Zimbabwe have been in a relationship with a husband who constantly lies and breaks promises to us and covers them up in such a ridiculous way and expects that we would believe it. But the time for silence has passed. And the time has come for us to band together and speak up for each other. Raise your voice. Let it sound be heard. If you are in the arts, where are your protest songs? Where are your redemption songs? Our generation has got to write its own songs. Our fathers and our mothers, when they went to war, they wrote their own liberation songs. They wrote their own encouraging and inspirational songs. If that is your gift, this is your time to stand up and get involved in our struggle. Write a song that we can sing. That when they arrest us, we sing it in the prison. That when they oppress us, we sing it even whilst they load our backs with work that benefits only them. A song that we can teach to our children and say this is what we sang when they tried to take our future. A song that we can say we sang this when they tried to destroy your future. You see, I come from a family that has four generations that have had their futures taken by the same person. My grandfather, my father, myself. And now my daughters, when I look at my five-year-old and my three, and the one to come in November, <laughs> I cannot allow that same system and that same thinking, the same evil to rob my children of a future that they deserve. It stops with me. I stand up and I raise my voice and I say to them, not anymore, not today, and not ever again. And even if someone else should come as a new government, I want them to know that they are a people that are prepared to defend and fight for their future. We've taken, we've gone on for too long. For 36 years, we've been quiet. And when David arrived, it had been 40 days and 40 nights where his brothers 
had been fighting a battle and he decided that there would be no day number 41. Today I want to invite you to make a decision that there will be no year number 37. And so let us use our gifts and our talents because it is what we have to ensure that the sound of the voiceless is not left unheard. We have come up with so many ways of protesting, so many ways of putting pressure. And sometimes it looks like we're not going anywhere. Sometimes it looks like what we're doing is just in vain. But please, be patient with us. It is our first time. We have not done this ever before. We're like children that are just learning to walk. And when you see a child learning to walk, sometimes when they stumble and fall, as somebody who loves that child and loves what they're doing and looks forward to the day that a child walks, you don't get up and shout at them and say how stupid you are that you can't even walk. No, what you do is you run towards them with your hands outstretched because they're doing something that's moving them to the next level of their life. And this is what we are doing as Zimbabweans. Sometimes when we look at ourselves, it's been two months of protesting. And sometimes people look at myself and the other movements that have been started in my nation. And they say, you're taking too long. And they say, but nonviolence won't work because you must go ahead. This government understands nothing but violence. They understand nothing but war. It's only been two months, but we have been able to shake a regime and cause them to behave in ways that they never, ever thought that they would behave. We are agreeing with my generation that for as many days as we can going forward, we will tie them down in protests. We will tie them down in lawsuits. We will tie them down in lifting our voices. We will shine our light where there is darkness. We will risk our lives in exposing their corruption. Because enough is enough and we can no longer take one more day of our futures being destroyed. This season needs everyone. It's not enough for one person to stand up. And because I stood up, it doesn't mean that it is my battle. This is not my movement. Yes. It doesn't belong to me. This is yours. This is for you to own. This is for you to begin to inspire. What idea do you have? What, what, what strategy do you have? Because that is as important, it is needed. i never forget a few days ago, we stood in Jube Park in central Johannesburg and stood with about 18 Zimbabweans, amongst them comprising vendors and cross-border traders and cleaners, people that have menial jobs. We didn't even have anywhere to sit, we just had our flags and we stood in a circle and we talked about, so what ideas do we have to move forward? There was one citizen who really inspired me. His name is Runyanaro, I'll never forget him. He said, Pastor, my name is Runyarado. Do you mind if I say something? And for those of you that don't know, the name Runyarado means peace or it means quietness. <coughs> and so he says, may I speak? And I said, yes, you may, Runyarado. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, Pastor, our nation is looking for about $1.8 billion. And I said, yes, I believe so. And he says, wouldn't it be beautiful if all the citizens of Zimbabwe across the world could contribute to raise $1.8 billion and then we step up to our government and tell them that the IMF won't give them money, that the French won't give them money, that the British won't give them money, but we the citizens have got the money that they need, but it's only accessible when our conditions are met. <laughs> This young man looked at me and he says, Pastor, is it not possible that we could become the first citizens of the planet to bail out their government? <laughs> but you see, whether that idea works or not, for me the exciting thing is that the idea came and came from a place that no one expected. This is the thing about Zimbabwe going forward. Our freedom or our struggle or the change that we want is coming from the place that no one expected it would come from. Yes. It's coming from people that a lot of people had written off and said we don't see them saying anything. We don't see them doing anything. 
And that's the beauty of what you and I are doing. <coughs> that those that people thought had nothing to offer are the ones that actually have something that could take our nation forward. A friend of mine made a comment the other day after I had left Zimbabwe. I left Zimbabwe pretty much immediately after they had let me out of jail. But even before I had been let out of jail that day, the experience I had had is like nothing I've ever encountered before. I saw Zimbabweans do something that even they never thought they could do. I saw a courtroom packed with people I had never seen, and yet each of them identified with me and each other as if they had been friends for a very long time. I saw 100 lawyers coming to defend a man who did not have a cent to pay them. I saw thousands of people wait into the night, buy each other candles to light them, because for them it wasn't about the guy that was in the courthouse. It was about the freedoms and the justice that every citizen of Zimbabwe deserves. And that day the citizens of Zimbabwe made a statement to themselves and to our government that you can no longer molest the people of our nation. Neither can you try and steal our future. We are awake and we see you. And as I left and came out to South Africa on the little business I had, and including meeting with the citizens of Zimbabwe, our president made the remarks that people like Mawari should never come back. And he said that people like me in the next speech should be dealt with severely. And I remember I said to a friend of mine, I need to, I need to go back because I may let the people down. And he looked at me and he told me a truth that I will never forget for the rest of my life. He said to me, Ivan, if the people of Zimbabwe still need a martyr to die for them, if they still need a martyr, then they don't, they are not ready for freedom. In my mind, which is not as educated as many people that are here, it meant to me that we cannot continue to put the future that we want or the delivery of the future that we want into the hands of one person or into the hands of one party. We can no longer operate with the savior mentality. <coughs> Citizens, the one thing that I have learned, the one thing that we have learned is that no one is coming to get us but ourselves. <coughs> Today we realize in Zimbabwe that we are the heroes that we have been waiting for. Upcoming on the 8th of August in Zimbabwe will be Heroes Day. And indeed, we honor the men and women that laid their lives for the liberation of our country. But I think also on that day we start to celebrate ourselves as the heroes of our own nation. The 6th of July 2016 is something that almost every Zimbabwean will remember, maybe not ZBC, but the rest of the <laughs> will remember that day for a long time. It is my hope that no matter what happens, the 6th of July is going to be a holiday that the citizens of Zimbabwe will award themselves without permission of the government. Because it is a day that we snatched back our rightful place. It is a day that we stood and we said, not anymore. We are the ones in control. I, look, I will end with two quotes that have driven us. My friend Henry and I sat in my office many weeks ago as we began to think, what do we do? What do we do to make our government notice? We came up with a phrase that I want to leave with you today. And it simply says this. If we cannot cause the politician to change, then we must inspire the citizen to be bold. And this is the essence of what we are doing with this flag and with the many of the movements that have started in Zimbabwe. <laughs> Emboldening each other, causing each other to scale the wall of fear. To realize that on the other side of our fear is a reality that we actually never thought possible, but one that we will enjoy for the rest of our lives.
Before I give you the last one, I must explain to you the school I come from. I'm a person who is not very advanced in their academic acquisition. I went to school, first and foremost, my dad sent me to school. He worked as a civil servant all his life and sent me to a good school. And the school is Prince Edward Boys High School. Yeah. <laughs> but whilst I was there, the first three years of my school, at the end of my form three, my form three, I brought back a report card for my dad that was frightening for any parent. <laughs> Any parent that had parted with money for their son to get education. My dad was shocked and immediately made a decision that I would not carry on my schooling years at Prince Edward. He said to me, Sir, you have five brothers and sisters coming up behind you. I cannot afford for this kind of precedence to be what they follow. Therefore, I will change your location for education. I thought my dad was going to send me to the school next door or to the school down the road, but no. What my dad did was to send me to a school that until two years ago did not, the location of that school actually did not exist on the map of Zimbabwe. <laughs> it is at a little township up in Mashonaland West, right up further towards the north of the country, a little township called Magunje. <laughs> At that school, I did not only go in to do my Form 4, but I had to repeat my Form 3 and then do my Form 4. I'll never forget the first day I walked into that school. The school had no fence around it because the locals had stolen it, but they had a gate. <laughs> but they had a gate. And everybody went through the gate. The school had two buildings in it. The one was the headmaster's <coughs> office and the staff room. And the other building was divided into two classes, which the whole school shared on a hot sitting arrangement. I went from a school where I would go to school with a hockey stick to a school where I would go to school with what we call in Shona Bemba. <laughs> or a slasher. Same shape as a hockey stick. <laughs> I'll never forget when we would study at night at this school because there was no electricity. We used to take glass bottles of, uh, uh, of alcohol, glass, empty glass bottles of alcohol, fill them with paraffin, put on the bottle top, make a hole, put a shoelace on the inside, and light that shoelace so that there was light for you to study. It would billow black smoke, and I always make my dad feel bad when I say to him, the black smoke actually destroyed my eyes. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> glasses. But sometimes these bottles would explode on you whilst you were studying, and they'll fill your books and your clothes with the smell of paraffin. And the next day, I had to almost explain to your friends that, no, it's a new fragrance called You're the Fire. <laughs> every single day before they sat down next to me to go to school. These young women were so bright they would 
They would wake up early in the morning, about two or three in the morning, to fetch water for their homes and brothers and sisters before they came to school. And even when they got back home, before they sat down to study, they would first of all go and find the cattle that their family owned and bring them back home and only sit down to study at maybe 10 or 11. And they would do better than I would do in their schooling, only never to write their examinations when time for all level exams came. Because while there was always enough money for school fees, there was never enough money to register for exams. So they repeated year after year after year. And those that had lost complete hope in ever writing their exams only returned to school so that they could play football or so that they could be the champions in the athletics of the school. And it made me think when I left that school in 1994, holding my O-level certificate, which by the way is my highest level of educational acquisition. I have no more than that except a few courses that I have done. My dad said to me when I got home and I had passed, and it's the first time that I looked at my dad and I said to him, you know, when you sent me to this school, I hated you with every bone in my body. But thank you so much, dad, for making a wonderful decision. For me not just to pass, but for me to understand what life really is about. <coughs> my dad said to me, my son, it's entirely up to you now. If you want to go ahead with your schooling, I can work hard for you to do so. But my desire is that you will join me in the ranks of working so that your brothers and sisters can also go to school. And I chose the latter. Why do I share that? To let you know that sometimes for people like myself, it's not so much the qualifications that we have that convince us that we can serve our nation. <coughs> but it's the pride that we carry in our hearts. And so that one day when we stand up, when I stand up the way I stood up, you can never point to any qualification that I have. And the only thing that you can always say that caused him to stand up was the fact that he knew how hard life was and was not prepared to face another day with life of that nature. And so as I finally closed tonight, and as a pastor we always have about seven closings. <laughs> I do want to say to my fellow citizens a quote that I find to encapsulate everything that we are doing. That we can no longer be divided by the politics of our nation, but we must now be united by the dreams of our children. May God bless you citizens of Zimbabwe. May God bless Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. God bless you and thank you very much for having me.